And welcome back to the Cloud Church. <clears throat> this is Robert Breaker, Missionary Evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. And we've been going verse by verse through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written. And last time we started in Romans chapter 1. And we got all the way down to verse 17. We stopped on verse 17. So today we'll stop our start on verse 18. But before we get started, let me back up just a tad. I always like to write an outline up here on the board, and I forgot to do that last time because, well, I really had so much up here. I just, there were so many things that I wanted to present. If you haven't seen that, go back and look at that uh, video. We talked about the book of Acts, and we showed how all the different books of Paul, where they lined up in the book of Acts. And we looked at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and how Paul had to deal with sin so much in that church that a lot of that book was written about sin. Well, what we're going to find out today is that when Paul writes to this church in Romans, which, by the way, is after what he wrote to 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul goes out of his way in chapter 1 to lamb blast sin. So it's almost like Paul was you know, beating his head against the wall. I'm so sick of dealing with sin in these churches that when he starts writing to Romans, he said, I'm going to deal with this from the get-go and try to tell them about, about sin and how evil it is. So it's interesting. We're going to see that today. Now, Here's a brief outline of the book of Romans. Uh, chapters 1 through 5 are more historical. He talks about history. I might put 5 more in doctrinal because there's a lot of good doctrinal stuff in chapter 5. And also there's some doctrinal stuff in chapter 3, especially verse 25. So, But this is an outline that someone gave. Chapters 1 through 5, historical. Chapter 6 through 7, doctrinal. Chapters 9 through 11, prophetic. Chapters 12 through 14, on practical things. And on 15 and through 16 is his conclusion. So that's one basic outline of the book of Romans. And as I said earlier, Romans, I don't know if I said this last time, but Romans was where Rome is. Paul was under the Roman Empire in his day. So the equivalent of that would be like us in America, if we were Paul and we were missionaries, it would be like us writing a letter to the church in Washington, D.C., that's the capital of the entire nation. Well, Paul was writing to the capital of the entire Roman Empire that Paul was under at the time. So it's pretty amazing. This, this is it. I mean, you couldn't go to a better place to reach the entire, entire Gentile world because the entire Gentile world at that time was under the Roman Empire, which spoke Greek. So if you want to reach America today, it's like you're going to Washington, D.C., and from there trying to go out to the rest of, of the United States, which I don't want to do. I want to stay away from that cesspool of Washington, D.C., where there's just sin everywhere. And there was probably sin everywhere in Romans as well. And as a matter of fact, what we're going to find in chapter 1 of Romans is one of the most grievous sins that a person can do. And um, let me just say from the get-go, this is Romans chapter 1. Yes, this is that place that many people don't like to go to in the Bible. So this is not to offend anyone. What I'm doing today is just reading the Bible. I'm not going to give my opinions or try to put anyone down. I'm just going to read what the Bible says about this one specific sin. So if you're offended, remember that you're offended with God. Take it up with Him, not with me. Don't, don't kill the messenger, as the old saying goes. All I want to do is just read the verses, verse by verse, and comment on them. Show references and show different things that speak about it. But this is a very powerful, powerful chapter of Romans, chapter 1, because it has a lot to say against the sin of homosexuality. Now you say, you call it a sin. No, I didn't. The Bible calls it an abomination, which is a sin. And it tells us in this chapter, not only that it's a sin, but it tells us how a person ends up in that sin. There's actually a, 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 a stages, I guess is the word. There's different stages that people get into as they actually fall and degrade. And the Bible calls them reprobates, verse 28. They become reprobates by going down these stages of sin. Uh, one guy called it the seven steps down to hell. And you continue on in those stages and those steps of sinning more and worse and worse and worse. It'll take you straight to hell. Because it will make you reprobate. The person who is reprobate is not in their right mind. And very few people get saved who are reprobates. Now I'm not going to say like one famous uh, YouTube preacher says, that homosexuals can't be saved. They can. Jesus Christ can save anybody. Thank God. 
to say that there's a certain group or a certain class or a certain race of people that God can't save is to downgrade the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. It's, it's basically to say, oh, well, Jesus wasn't powerful enough to save them. He is powerful enough to save anyone. I don't care if they're the worst homosexual that ever lived. They can be saved. The problem is usually they don't want to be. And so that's why people don't get saved. They don't want to. And the more people end up in this sin, the less they want to be saved. So the best thing to do is to keep people as far away from this sin as you can. The problem is this sin has been crammed down the throat of people in America today so much that they took it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, no, it's okay. And now we're supposed to put up with it like it's no big deal. It is a big deal. God has destroyed nations throughout history for this heinous and horrible sin. And he's going to destroy America too because of it. So we as Christians, we're supposed to be separate from the world and get away from it. Never be guilty of this sin. But also we're to preach be instant in season, out of season. See, it's not in season today to preach against this sin. But the Bible says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And that's what we want to do. We want to be long suffering. We speak the truth in love, the Bible says. We're to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Well, long suffering means we have to put up with what they do. We don't like it. We let them know from the get go. We do not like what you do. Neither does God. But, because you are a person and a human being and you have a soul that will end up for an eternity in one of two places, I want to tell you this is how you can go to heaven. Now, if homosexuals get saved, praise God, I have only met one in my life. Most people that are homosexuals do not want anything to do with God in the Bible. So it's very rare that homosexuals get saved, but they can get saved. But then they have to deal with that the rest of their life. And boy, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. That, that's got to be tough to have to think about all those things that you've done in the past and have to deal with all those sins. But the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. And how much more shall the blood of Christ purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So, homosexuals can be saved. All right? I just want to say that from the beginning because I know some of you that watch this, you watch that other guy, and you know who I'm talking about most likely who stands up and tells everybody he can't be saved if you're a homosexual. That's not true. That's basically saying that Jesus Christ's blood is not powerful enough to wash away all sins. It is. It is powerful enough to wash away the most vilest, sickest, disgusting sins. There was a guy named Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was evil. Evil. Jeffrey Dahmer used to cut off people's heads and put their, their um, heads in his refrigerator and then do wicked and vile things to their, do their dismembered bodies. I won't go into that. But I heard that Jeffrey Gomer got saved in jail. If God can save somebody like that, to God be the glory. So it's all about giving God the glory. It's not about saying there's certain people that can't be saved. That doesn't give God glory. That basically says God's not powerful enough and His blood's not powerful enough to cleanse all sins. So I say God can save anybody. The thing is, do those somebodies want to be saved? And sadly, many people, once they go down those seven steps to hell, and they become complete reprobates, they don't want to be saved. So what you have to do is say, God, please give them a want to, a want to be saved. Um, I think about uh, Jonah, you know. God told Jonah, I want you to go preach in Nineveh. Wicked, wicked place. And he said, no thanks, I don't want to. But what did God do? He gave him a want to. <laughs> As he was running away, God sent the way Olin put him through so much that, guess what? He wanted to do what God said. So that's what our prayer should be for homosexuals, is that God would work in their lives and bring them to the point where they want God more than their sin. And boy, that's hard because oftentimes they love sin more than God. And we'll see that in this chapter. So let's begin in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and right unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, almost all new versions change the word hold to hinder. But I like the English King James, hold the truth. Well, we hold the truth in our hands when we hold the Bible. So there's some people, especially in pulpits, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. There are ministers out here and out there who preach. And they preach holding the truth in their hand, but they preach lies. 
So we've got the wrath of God is against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So if you're ungodly and you're unrighteousness, the wrath of God is against you. The Bible says the wrath of God abideth on you. God's wrath is towards you because of your sin. God hates your sin. In order to have that wrath of God removed against you, you need to be saved. When you get saved, then there's peace made between you and God. Now, notice it says, hold the truth in unrighteousness. Let's go to, let's go to 2 Thessalonians real quick. And in 2 Thessalonians, we have a, a little thing that, that tells us about people who don't want the truth because they want unrighteousness. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10, there are people who don't want to be saved. And this is why they don't want to be saved. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They don't want the love of the truth. In other words, they don't love the truth. They don't love the Bible. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Because they don't love the Bible, God says, Okay, if you want to believe a lie, here's a good lie for you to believe. God will actually let them have a lie to believe if they don't want to believe the truth. Verse 12, that they all might be damned, that means they're going to hell, who believe not the truth. How do you get saved? By believing the truth, by believing the gospel, trusting the gospel. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that's what it all boils down to. What is the meaning of life? Have you seen that video on YouTube? I made a video on YouTube years ago on what's the meaning of life in three words or less. And the answer is Revelation 4.11. In three words or less, I can tell you what the meaning of life is. You say, well, that's, are you, what? For centuries and millennia, uh, philosophers have been writing volumes and volumes of books on, on what is the meaning of life. Well, I can tell you in three words that they couldn't even tell you in volumes and volumes and volumes of books. In Revelation 4.11, very end of the verse, says, For thy pleasure they are and were created. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So why are we here on this earth? Why are we created? Why does man exist? Three words. For his pleasure. God created man to please him. The problem is when man wants to please themselves rather than God. So who are you pleasing? Are you pleasing yourself? Or are you pleasing God? Well, if all you care about is yourself and pleasing yourself, then you will begin down those steps, those seven steps to hell. And you'll become utter and total reprobate that only lives for self-gratification and pleasure. And when all you care about is pleasuring yourself, you're gone. It's very hard to come back from that to want God more than your sin. Uh, Moses, the Bible says in, in Hebrew, he, he uh, chose the reproach of his people. Uh, rather than to enjoy sin for a season, the Bible says. So it says here in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So without a doubt, God hates sin. He's against ungodliness and unrighteousness. So does that mean God is against a homosexual? Yeah. But what does that also mean? Homosexuals are against God. For sure. Because they love their pleasure more than they love God. So they don't want to be saved because they enjoy what they're doing. They enjoy their sin. Sadly, they don't enjoy it forever. I've talked to many homosexuals, and I tell them, Really? Are you really gay? Because the word gay means happy. Look at me in my eyes and tell me that you're really, really happy what you do. And everyone I've ever talked to, I haven't talked to one that never told me, that told me otherwise. Everyone has told me, Well, I'm not really happy. You know, they say, and I don't want to get gross into what they do, but they say, yeah, it might be pleasurable for a little while, but afterwards it makes me feel sad to do what I do. Yeah, yeah, it should. It should. Because it's against God and it's against nature, we'll find in this verse. So even though you're gay when you're engaging in that sexual sinful act, afterwards you feel horrible because you know what you did was gross, dishonorable, disgusting, something that might have felt good for a little bit, but really, it makes you feel bad because you know you shouldn't be doing it. That's a conscience. And the Bible says you can sear that conscience. And when you do, watch out. You become a reprobate, and you can't control yourself, then you're going to hurt yourself and others. I read one time that 80% of all murderers in, pr in prison that did outrageously horrible, horrible crimes were homosexuals. 
So once you start down that road of pleasure and sin and evil, sin will take you over to where you become reprobate and you do the most heinous, disgusting, evil acts that you never thought that you would do. Why is that? Because oftentimes, when you become so sinful and so wicked and so ungodly, you open yourself up to a demon. And when that demon takes over, whew, and there's no limit what that demon can do. And so, that's why it should keep yourself pure. You should keep yourself pure and away from sin. It's just, it's scary what the human body can do to others when, it's, when there's no restraints upon it. And the more you sin, and that conscience is seared, and there's no more restraints, it's sick what people can do to other human beings. So, verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So this verse is telling us that God put something in man, has showed man, look, this is right and this is wrong. In other words, every person that's born is born with that knowledge inside of them of what right and wrong is. And as you get old, like I said, there's that conscience, and we'll read about that, inside you. And you feel bad when you do wrong. But if you continue to do wrong, that feeling bad will go away because you've become a reprobate. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So according to this, the invisible things of God, of the creation, are clearly seen. You can't look at God's creation without seeing God, unless you want to be blind. You look at the zodiac, the stars in heaven. There's a certain thing. I read a book one time, um, something to do about the, the gospel and the stars. And it showed how there's all these different stars and they all have a meaning. And if you look at them and look at the Bible, they all tie in the Bible and show a picture painted in the stars of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and His coming back to this earth and then the Antichrist taking over for a short time. And all those stars, they teach something that lines up with the King James Bible and Bible prophecy. Now you can't tell me that was accident. The things that God made in the creation are clearly seen, and it shows you don't have an excuse to say, I don't believe in God. You have the stars. You have, you have an atom. You look at an atom. You can't help see, see God. What's an atom? Well, it's three parts. So without those three parts, it doesn't work. What are the three parts? You've got a proton, you've got a neutron, and you've got an electron. So three parts. Well, what does the Bible say God is? He's a trinity. Three parts. One God, but three parts. Just like man. It says man has made his image. We're, we're one man, but three parts. We're a triune being. So God made that electron. Well, the proton and the neutron are together, and an electron is spinning around that. You've got the three parts. You break things down to the, the most basic, simple level, and God's going, hi. You've got that moving around. The Spirit of God moves around. There's three parts to an atom, just like there's three parts of God. Look at DNA. You could not have set up that sequence of DNA and it just automatically happened on accident. No, it shows intelligent design and creator created man in such a way that it shows, well, well, somebody invented this, somebody made this in such a way to where it fits together and there's actually a code that it's all coded together and made the way it is. So this verse tells us the invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So if you say, I don't believe in God, you're without excuse. There's no excuse for a person to say, I don't believe in God. Every day you look over here and the sun rises. It goes all the way over here, and as it goes down, it turns blood red, and it sets. What's the blood red? Well, it's a type of Christ. The Bible actually says that Jesus Christ is the Son of Righteousness. So the Son is a type of Christ. What happened? He set, or he died, and he rose again. He set, he died, he rose. How did he die? Red, blood. The Son is showing you the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ every day in type. So you can't live in this life and say, oh, I don't believe in God. You're willfully ignorant if you refuse God. Now, why do people not want to believe in God? We already saw. The reason people don't want to believe in God is because if there is a God, they're going to have to give account to Him someday. They're going to have to be judged by Him. Well, if you're a sinner, the last thing you want to do is think about being judged for your sins. So the easiest thing to do is say, well, I don't believe in God. 
And then you can go sin, and it won't hurt your conscience. So then you don't feel bad. What are you going to do when you wake up in hell? And what are you going to do when God calls you out of hell at the great white throne of judgment and says, okay, let's judge you according to your sins? You say, I don't believe in that. I don't care if you believe in it or not. The Bible says it's true, and it will happen. And as you're burning in hell, listening to my voice, you'll remember that I told you one day, the Bible says it's going to happen. And you'll sure say, boy, I was sorry. I wish I hadn't. I wish I had listened. I wish I had believed in God. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, darkened. Every child in this, in this world, when they're born, they know there's a God. You can't, as a little child, grow up and just look at all the streams and all the lakes and all the stars and, and think, wow, nothing made this. Isn't this wonderful how nothing made this? Back in the back of your mind, you think, wow, something made all this. Everybody's born. They're without excuse to say there's no God. So when they knew God, everyone knows God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. That's where these seven steps start down into hell. Unthankfulness. It's called ingratitude. It's being unthankful. That's why it's so important that children raise, uh, parents raise their children to be thankful. In other words, when they get something, they say, thank you, thank you. Otherwise, a child just starts taking and taking and doesn't care. And that kind of person the rest of their life will hurt others because they'll do whatever they want to take from others. So the best way to be is to be thankful. So the step toward hell begins with being unthankful. But it says when they knew God, people when they're born, they have this inherent knowledge that there's a God. They have a conscience. They know right from wrong. When do they disbelieve God? Usually when they go to college. You know, people go to college supposedly to get smarter, but they don't. They don't get smarter. They're, they're dumbed down on purpose. And they're taught in college, oh, you believe in God? You're stupid. You're just so dumb. Here, believe this instead. Well, what's the alternative? Evolution. Okay, so over here, I believe there's a God. He made all this thing. Everything shows and proves that he's real. You look at the constellations that paint in the stars a picture of 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 the gospel of, of the history of man in the stars. You look at the DNA. You look at the atoms. Everything proves intelligent design. It's just all there to see and to say, wow, someone made this. But then they say, no, 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 get over here and believe what we believe, evolution. There's no God. Oh, yeah, well, what's, what's the proof? Uh, oh, well, we don't have any proof of evolution. Well, well, you have no proof of evolution? No, well, we have Lucy, but it's been proven a hoax. And we have the Neanderthal man, and we've had... But they were all proven hoax. But, but just believe it, because we say so. Okay, well, how did everything start? Well, nothing exploded. Huh? But I was just in my uh, class of, of science, and they said that for something to explode, there must be a mass. And the mass is what explodes. And energy can't be destroyed or created, just change form. So, oh no, no, don't believe that. I mean, even that's scientific. Just believe that nothing, there was just absolutely nothing, and it just went boom and blew up. But that's against logic. That's, shut up! Your, your uncle was a monkey. You have to believe you came from monkey. See how dumb it is? What evolution teaches. It denies evidence. It denies facts. It insults you and tells you your uncle was a monkey. And yet, when you just start looking around in nature and saying, wow, this proves there's a God, because look at everything that's made and how awesome it is, they say, shut up. Well, you know what most colleges are nowadays? They're a bunch of factories for sex. You go to college not to learn, you go to college to party. They're party factories. And so most people go to college and come out dumber than they were before. Why is that? Well, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was, dark, was darkened. So they decided, I don't want to believe in God. Because of that, this is what happened to them. You know, most of the colleges in the United States of America were founded as ministerial colleges. They were to produce preachers. Harvard University in Boston was founded as a theological school to train men to go out and preach the gospel to the lost and dying world. What is Harvard now? A place that hates God, hates anything to do with God, a party school where people go and, and uh, do evil things and party. It's the exact opposite. Verse 22, wonderful verse. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Well, you say, well, that's insulting. Yeah, not as insulting as saying my, 
my uncle is a monkey. Yeah, yeah, like evolution does. So God says, people that think they're wise, if they deny God, then they're fools. Because the creation itself proves intelligent design. I want to go to Psalm 14 and verse 1 and see what God says makes a man a fool. In Psalms 14, 1, it says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And the verse continues, They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. So God says, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. So if a person once believed in God, and then they get talked out of their faith in God, then they're fools, God says. And guess what? They're corrupt. They're evil. They're unrighteous. They're in sin. Because it's so easy, if you're a sinner and want to sin and love the pleasure of sin, to say, I don't believe in God, because that makes it easier to sin, because you don't have to think about judgment. You don't have to think about repercussion. You don't have to think about, oh, I'll have to give account of this one day. So that's why so many people hate God, hate the Bible, because they love sin. Because if you love God and you love the Bible, you hate sin, and you want to do right. So professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Many people in this world say they're wise, and God looks down and says, you're so dumb. And yet, that's the world we live in, where the dumb fools are in high authorities, of positions of authority in schools, and they're teaching people and making them dumber than they would be before. We call it the dumbing down of America. Well, look at verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Well, they teach in college, oh, God didn't create us, and we weren't made smart from the beginning with this great vast of knowledge that God gave us. Oh, no, we started as cavemen, and we were dumb, and we slowly learned over history how to be smart and now we're so smart today well because they teach that what do they say well, they, well the cavemen were so dumb the first thing they did was just start to to make themselves little idols to worship and they worship their little idols yeah that's what a man does when he denies God there's no such thing as an atheist everybody has a God whether they know it or not most people who say, I don't believe in God, they're their own God. They trust in themselves as though they themselves were God. So there's no such thing really as an atheist. But when someone denies God and says, I want nothing to do with God, what do they do? They try to change God into a God of their own mind or their own image. And usually they make idols. Idol worship is the reprobate mind trying to make their own God and fashion it the way they want it to be. I preached a message years ago entitled, Two Gods. There's the one true God, and he's like this. And then there's the false God, the God you invent in your mind that you think God should be like. And so you try to make God into what you want, into your image. And that's what the world does today. They make their own God. They change the glory of God into an image. Like a man, or a bird, or a beast, or a creeping thing. And you go through the Bible, you find a lot of different idols. And so these idols are... Like it says here, birds and men and four-footed beasts. Uh, when the children of Israel left Egypt, what did they do? They made an idol that was a four-footed beast. It was a calf. Uh, there's people that make idols and images of, of human beings, of man. Um, creeping things. So idol worship is a sign of a person who is vain in their own imaginations. In verse 12. A person who took the light of God, the conscience, and blew it out and said, I don't want God, I want to make my own God. And that's what people do that turn against God. They try to make their own God. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now notice, verse 23, well, let me start. Verse 22, ignorance. Willful ignorance. Verse 23, idol worship. So when people turn against God, they don't forget God altogether. They make their own gods, and they make idols. And then what do they do in verse 24? Fornication. What they do is they begin to fornicate in front of their gods. All throughout the Old Testament, when the evil ones took over a veil, they're always doing fornication in front of idols. I don't have time to go into it, but I believe firmly that idol worship is the worship of demons. 
I believe that when you make yourself an idol and you build an idol, demons get into that because they want that worship. And so people worship that idol. That idol has a demon behind it. And the Bible calls demons seducing spirits. And so it allures to the flesh. And what happens? Today they say the highest form of worship is having sex with someone because you love them so much. What is that? So, so sin is the highest form of worship. That's what they say. So what you have is you have people that turn from God. The first thing they do is they become fornicators. They become sensual. They become, well, basically they begin to worship the human form, the human body. And then they begin to dishonor their bodies between themselves. So wherefore, verse 24, God gave them also up to uncleanliness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So people that turn from God, the reason they do, as we've seen, is because they love pleasure more than God. And what is the pleasure? They love to pleasure themselves. And they love to worship the human form. That's why they make images of man or woman. Pornography, if you will. And then verse uh, 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So they worship creatures more than the Creator. Isn't that sad? Idol worship. Again, verse 20, 25 is idol worship. So verse 26, God says, okay, because you worship the creature more than me, because you want pleasure more than you want to please me, here's what I'm going to do. Verse 26, for God gave them, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, verse 27, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of error that was meet. So verse 25, idol worship again. Then you get to verse 26 and 27, look at what it says. Verse 26 says they do something that's vile. Now, I'm not going to get into what the act of homosexuality is. No, thank you. I don't want to talk about that at all. But what it is, it's against nature. So they do something that's unnatural. Why is that? Well, I think it's because of a demon that comes into them, that makes them think these horrible things to do these vile and wicked things. Verse 27 says it's unseemly. So, do you see, I've got a message on YouTube about this, what the Bible says about homosexuality. If you get a chance, check that out. But it also says it's an error. So, it's an erroneous, anti-natural, vile, unseemly thing for a person to become a homosexual and engage in those things. Now, verse 28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. So, first God gives them up. Then God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So to do such a thing is to be a reprobate. So it's, it's an evil and vile thing to partake in those acts, those sensual, fleshly, sinful acts of what this verse is talking about. What is the verse talking about, verse 26 and 27? homosexuality. Women with women, men with men. I'm not going to go any deeper into it than that. That's what the Bible is talking about. Verse 20, <clears throat> oh, also in verse 28 it says, to do those which are not convenient. So they do things that are not so they do things that God says are not convenient. They're not right. They're things that should not be done. Now, that's what God says. He says, there are people in this world that turn against God, that hate God, that want nothing to do with God. So what does this tell us about homosexuals? That they hate God. And yet, all the homosexuals tell Christians, you hate us, you hate us. We don't hate you, we want to see you get saved. But we know that you have a problem, and that you are the hater, because you hate God. Because the Bible tells us that. That because of your love for sin, and be willing to do such horrible things to gratify your flesh, we know that God said you're reprobate. And so we see that when you attack us, it's because of your sin. You don't attack us because we're the bad guys. It's because we're the just. 
We're the righteous ones. We're the ones that love God and love truth. We're the ones that love God and love purity. So you've got two sides. You've got that side that's evil, and then you've got this side over here that's pure. And they want to live a pure life in purity. They want to be moral. They want to be clean. You see, this over here is uncleanliness. I just didn't write that down. Where is it? It says, it says something about uncleanliness. Well, okay, we're going to get to that. So, 26, 27, 28, all talks about homosexuality. And that's what will make a person a reprobate. Now, you say that and people say, that's hate speech. Okay, well then the Bible is hate speech. And take it up with God. Just leave me alone, please. Because I'm not attacking you, I'm not putting you down. All I'm doing is reading what God said. He said, if these people start on this path of sin and, and turning against me, then they continue in that and they're going to end up being not only against God, but against nature. And do things that are unseemly and error and not convenient and do things that are wrong. But you know, he didn't stop there. I want you to look at what the rest of this says. It says in verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now the end of that verse has a semicolon. So what that means is that verse 29, 30, 31, and 32, God is going to tell us what's inside the mind of a reprobate person. So that semicolon is really revealing there in verse 29. It gives us a glimpse into the mind of a reprobate person. It says in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, okay, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. What? They have murder in their heart? Yes. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covetous breaker, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same but have pleasure in them, that do them. So here we have four verses that tell us what a person who is a reprobate homosexual is like. It tells us exactly what they are. How would anyone know that if it was just a man writing this book? It's God in heaven looking into the heart of that kind of person and he told Paul, write down what all they are. And boy is there a big list of what those people are. It's incredible. So let's well, the, the neat thing about this, I went through and counted one time all the different things. And I found there was, between verses 21 through, 20, through 32, I found 18 different things about people who are lost and what they're guilty of. They're guilty of, number one, not glorifying God, verse 21. They're guilty of unthankfulness, verse 21. They are vain, verse 21. They are foolish and dark, verse 21. One, they're professing wisdom, but they are the dumbest people. Verse 22, they change the image of God into idolatry. Verse 23, they have uncleanliness. Verse 24, that's what I was looking for. Uncleanliness. Verse 24 says uncleanliness. It's unclean what they do. I'm just going to put uncleanness. I'll change the word, I guess. <clears throat> yep, that's the word, uncleanliness. uncleanness. Two ends, but I put one. Oh, well. And um, another thing is they have, they're full of lust, verse 24. They, they engage in sexually dishonorable practices, verse 24. They change truth to a lie, verse 25. They worship a man and animals, verse 25. They have vile affections, verse 26. Verse 26, we find lesbianism. Verse 27, we find sodomy and sexual sins. Verse 28, they forget God, verse 28. They reprobate, uh, verse 28. They do inconvenient things. And verse 29, they're full of evil. So, 18 different things that I found in this chapter about a lost person. And that's interesting because 18 is 6 plus 6 plus 6. Huh? Which is what? The number of the Antichrist to the number of the beast. It's a satanic number. So what does that mean about such people? Well, what that means is, if you choose to serve your own self and forget God, then what are you doing? You're serving Satan. So on this side, we have God's people. And they're to be pure, moral, clean, righteous, just, 
And people like that are great people to be around because they're nice. They're usually very nice and, and thoughtful. They think about you. And you know, you look at America, how it was founded, and you look at America today, and you see a nation that went from being this to being this. And a nation that's like this can never stand. Because this side raises children that are taught to respect others and to be nice and thoughtful and to love and think about others more than themselves and to treat others correctly and pure. And a people like that are a good people that live clean and live long lives. But even science proves that when you become a homosexual, your lifespan is cut way down. Homosexuals have a very low lifespan because a lot of diseases that come with this. But these kind of people are a kind of people that serve Satan. The Church of Satan says, Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Under Satanism, it's all about you pleasing your flesh. If you join the Church of Satan, that's what they'll say, is just do whatever makes you happy. But this side is about sacrifice, making others happy before yourself. Esteeming others more highly than yourself. So you have two completely different type of people. This type is the people of God that please God. This is the type of people that hate God and want to please themselves. And by so doing, whether they know it or not, they're serving Satan. And so we have a great problem. Now, I mentioned earlier the seven steps down to hell. What are the seven steps to hell? Let me just read my notes here real quick. This is a good, uh, good service, uh, sermon for someone to preach if he's a preacher. The first step to hell was they knew God and they glorified Him not. The next step is they were unthankful. The third step is they became vain in their imaginations. The fourth step was their foolish heart was darkened. How does your heart get darkened? How does your heart get hardened or get black? By turning against the light. You see, what this all ties into is this side is all about the light. God gave you the light of your conscience and following light. This side is all about dark and doing the dark and evil things. You know, people that live this kind of lifestyle, what do they like to do? They like to go out at night to the parties and the clubs where the lights are turned down really low. Well, the people on this side that are Christians, what do they like? They like to be in well-lit rooms. They like to go to churches and sit in there with the light and, 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 and just sit around and talk and, and do great things. So you see a spiritual darkness and a spiritual light over here. Jesus is the light. Well, it says the... the they, they weren't thankful, neither became vain in their imaginations. Uh, the fourth one is their foolish heart was darkened. The fifth one is they become fools. Whether they know it or not, they're fools. What does that mean? That means everything they do is foolish. It's foolish. Verse 6, they change God into an image, idol worship. Verse 7, God gives them up. And when God gives them up, well, that means they're, they're on their way to hell, and very few come back. Very few, once they become reprobate, ever say, you know what? I give up. I trust Jesus. Because they're so far gone that God says, all right, I'm giving you up. You know what that means? That means I'm no longer going to bring the Holy Spirit to, talk, to, 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 to convict you of your sins. You do whatever you want. I'll see you at the judgment. They still can be saved. There's still a chance. But God not, is not actively seeking them for salvation like he is for other people. Yes, they can be saved. But very few get saved. Well... Let's go back here to verse 29, and let's look again at what these people are. Being filled with all unrighteousness. So how are they filled? Well, the Bible tells us that a Christians be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we're saved, we get the Holy Spirit. Well, unsaved people are filled with this stuff. And a lot of this stuff is, is just so evil, it makes you wonder, are they filled with an unclean spirit? Being filled with all unrighteousness. What is unrighteousness? Which is anything that's not right is unrighteousness. Fornication. What is fornication? Fornication is any kind of sex outside of wedlock. And as we've looked at through this, this chapter, all homosexuality starts with fornication. Every person I ever met that was a homosexual, they used to be the worst fornicators you could, you could think of before they became homosexuals. Most of them were men that, that used to sleep around with a lot of women. And then they say, well, I've done that, I'm tired of it, now I'm going to try sleeping with men. And they become homosexual. So they start. it all starts with this right here. Same thing with women. 
They say, well, I'm going to try something new. And then they become homosexuals or, or lesbians. So they're filled with all unrighteousness and fornication. So fornication is the start that puts you down that path of this side. So that's why it's so important, if you're a Christian and you're a young pure person, that you keep yourself pure and that you don't have sex outside of wedlock. You wait until you're married to get in bed with your wife. You wait until you're married to get together with that, that act that God has, has given people to do in marriage. Don't do it outside of marriage. Fornication. Wickedness. Wickedness is just anything that's wicked, that's evil, that's unpure. Covetousness. What is covetousness? Wanting something that's not yours. So this side is all about, oh, I want more, I want more, I want more. It's, it's self-gratification. It's just utter and complete depravity. It's just, I give in to the flesh to do whatever it wants and lets it lead me. By that, let me write this word up here. Control. People that are this side that follow the light, they practice control. And they have what we call today self-control. This side over here has no self-control. And that's what's sad. That's what's scary. When a person is a reprobate and they have no self-control, then they'll go down this path so far that they can't control themselves. And they'll just do evil, wicked things. Atrocious, atrocious things. That's why it's so important to keep yourself pure so you never become a reprobate and you never give into the flesh so much that you can't control yourself. That's why it's so important to be able to control yourself and keep yourself from doing things that are wrong. Never lose control. Maliciousness. Maliciousness is just being malicious, just being mean on purpose, just doing mean things for fun. Maliciousness. Full of envy. Envy is, oh, I wish I had what they had. And what does envy stir up? Well, the next verse, the next word is murder. Sometimes people are so filled with envy that say, I, I wish I had what he had, that they go kill him to take it. That's not right. So murder, can you believe that? That in the heart of these people is murder. You know how many death threats people get when they speak up against, fornic against homosexuality? Quite a few. I haven't got any. I guess I'm long overdue for it. But this crowd, if you say I'm against homosexuality, they say you ought to die. Why would they say that? Because the Bible's true. That's in their heart is murder. They don't want anybody to talk against them and to get angry because they're full of maliciousness and hate and malignity. So we see a glimpse into the mind and heart of homosexual people. People that have given in to the flesh and have gone so far that God said, all right, I give you up. If you want to get saved, you're going to have to come to me. I'm tired of coming to try to find you. Now, if you want to get saved, you've got to come to me for salvation. So murder, debate. All they want to do is debate. They don't want to have a conversation and talk. No, all they want to do is yell, scream, holler. Deceit. Deceit, what does that mean? That means to deceive. That's from deceive. They want to deceive people. They don't want people to have the truth and believe the truth. They want people to believe a lie. Malignity. What is that? M malignity. That's just evil. Pure evil. Uh, whisperers. What is a whisperer? Well, it's somebody that, that behind your back goes, oh, what is that? You know? Well, what does that mean? Well, that means, oh, here comes Mr. Holier Than Thou. That guy thinks he's so great. That's the way they talk about people who try to live right who are Christians. Backbiters. Haters of God. There you go. In America today, they have a thing they call hate speech. And they say, if you say something against a certain class of people, then you, you're guilty of hate speech. Well, I'm sorry, but I have a Bible that tells me the exact opposite. That I'm not the one of hate speech. The person that's full of hate are these people. I don't believe there's such a thing as hate speech. Speech is speech. You can hate someone and then have a speech against them, but hate speech, that, that doesn't even make sense. How does a speech hate? A speech is just something that comes out of your mouth. How does that hate? Ha, oh, you're, you're evil. Oh, look at the hate. Just That came out of my mouth, now that hates? No, if I hated someone, then I'm the hater. So there's no such thing as hate speech. There's a hate person that's full of hate. It doesn't even make sense, the words they come up with. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful. They just want to be despiteful all the time. Proud. Now there's the problem. Pride. We're told in the Bible that Satan is the king of all the children of pride in the book of Job, it says. 
Pride was the first sin. Satan became prideful and said, you know, I think I'm better than God. I'm going to try to kick him out. And God kicked him out of heaven. Pride is a big sin. Isn't that funny, though? Pride. Well, isn't that what the gays do? And have parades, and they call it the gay pride parade? Hmm. <laughs> I guess they do follow the Bible. They just don't know it. Full of pride. Uh, proud. Boasters. They brag about themselves. Inventors of evil things. Now, I don't have to go into that, do I? I'm sure they invent all sorts of evil things to pleasure themselves with that are evil. Disobedience to parents. That's often where this all begins, is that children are disobedient to their parents, and because of that, their parents don't discipline them. And because of that, they say, well, I can do whatever I want. Nobody can stop me. Well, yeah, they should be stopped. There, there should be something that keeps kids in check. Kids should listen to their parents and obey their parents and uh, be kept in check so that they don't grow up and become reprobates that hurt other people. Verse 31, without understanding. Over on this side, this side is people that try to understand others. I truly do try to understand people like this. I want to understand. Why did they want to do that? Why do they... I try to understand other people. Well, I have a great understanding because the Bible tells me exactly what they're like and to stay away from them. Covenant breakers. What does that mean? That means you can't trust this people. They will lie to you. They will make a deal with you and then break it in a heartbeat without natural affection. Well, we've read that earlier. They're against nature. Nature, verse 26. Implacable. Implacable. Un I think that means unchanging. I mean, they'll never change. They Once they're there, they don't want to change. Now, something could happen. Maybe they get in a car wreck and they're near to death and they start thinking, well, if I die, I'm going to go to hell. You know, I've heard of deathbed conversions of people that were like this that got saved, and, and that's possible. Maybe they did. But usually they don't change. Unmerciful. They have no mercy. No mercy whatsoever. That's scary. That's scary. A person with no mercy, what they would do to you without any mercy whatsoever. Verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God. You know, you might say, I don't believe in God, but deep in the back of your mind, if you are guilty of these things, you know there is someday a reckoning that's coming that you will give account to God one day. And you keep pushing it out of your mind, but you know it's true. You know it's true who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, I want you to see what that says. Nowhere in the New Testament does it tell us to kill these people. We who are Christians don't have murder in our heart. These are the ones that are full of murder. We as Christians do not, do not kill such people. Now, with that stated, let's go to the Old Testament and look at the difference. Deuteronomy chapter, I believe it's chapter 18, talks about this homosexual, this sin of homosexuality. And under the law of God in the Old Testament, this was such a heinous and evil sin that guess what? There was a death penalty that went along with it. I'm in Deuteronomy. I guess it's in Le Leviticus 18. I'm sorry. Go to Leviticus. I said Deuteronomy. Go to Leviticus chapter 18. Look what the Bible says here about the Old Testament. Leviticus 18.22 Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. This is an Old Testament verse that says you will not engage in any acts of what they used to call in the old days buggery or homosexuality. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself with, with wherewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there unto. It is confusion. So no homosexuality, and guess what God says also? No bestiality. You see, those two sins are so close together. Usually when a person goes so far as to be a homosexual, they are so far gone and so into a reprobate mind that they would be willing to have sex with an animal. Now that's disgusting. And what does God say about that? Verse 24. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity therefore upon it, and the land itself vomited out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations. 
neither any of your own nation nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled that the land spew not you out also when you defile it as it spewed out the nations that were before you. God says when that takes place in the land, it defiles the land. Well, this is taking place in the United States of America with the approval of the Supreme Court. So what does that mean about the United States of America? It's a land that's defiled. Look at verse 29. For whosoever shall commit any of those abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall you keep mine ordinance that these that ye commit none of these things, of these abomination, abominable customs which were committed before you, that ye follow not yourselves therein. I am the Lord thy God. Uh, Leviticus 20 and verse 13, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. So you have a New Testament and the Old Testament. In the Old Testament... There was capital punishment for this sin. The New Testament were under grace. Back here it was works. And the works were, if a person did this sin, they were to be killed in the Old Testament. Aren't you glad we're not under the Old Testament anymore? We're under grace. So in the New Testament, there's no, there's no death penalty upon this. If you claim to be a Christian and you think we should kill homosexuals, you're wrong. You're wrong. We're under grace. Where sin abounds, grace doth more abound. So even though he says here that they that commit such things are worthy of death, he does not, and I repeat, does not tell us to kill people that are homosexuals. So no Christian should ever try to kill this type of people. And that's what's so sad today because there are people going around saying, oh, they ought to die, they ought to die. Yeah, well, Paul says they're worthy of death. That, that sin is so evil that it was the death penalty back here to do it. But we're not under there. What we ought to do is preach the gospel and hope to God people don't fall into this sin. And the reason that America is in the mess that it is today is because preachers are the problem. They are not preaching against sin strong enough to make people want to live right and holy. So verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, but it does not instruct us today to kill people. You cannot kill a person. It's murder. Don't do it unless it's in time of war. Then it's not murder. It says such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And notice how that ends. But have pleasure in them that do them. Notice it says have pleasure in them that do them. So, two things are there. You, you've got the idea of these people do this sin and they have pleasure in it. But it says there's others that have pleasure in them that are doing that. So it's not just that they're having pleasure in their sin. There are other people like-minded as these that when they hear that so-and-so did such-and-such, -such, they take pleasure and say, oh, that's wonderful that they did that. Now think about that. Someone commits this sin of bestiality and another person hears about it and says, oh, that's wonderful. Think about how disgusting that person is. They don't just partake of it. They enjoy hearing that other people partake of it as well. That's disgusting, is it not? But that's what the Bible says. Who not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So they're taking pleasure in those people that are doing that. And in this world, there are actually people that commit homosexuality and bestiality, they enjoy it themselves, and they enjoy it being around others that do it, so that they can build themselves the little kingdom of people that do it, and they enjoy hearing that so many people are doing it, just like themselves. That's why God said that this is something that shouldn't be, because this recruits, this builds, that it gets bigger, and it pulls more and more into its ranks. And that's sad. So that's Romans chapter 1. We finished it up. A lot to talk about there. God talks a lot about sin. And I think Romans chapter 1, the, the last half, what we've covered, covered today, is like a great big window. And it's a great big window in which we can see straight into the heart of these people. And what we see is not a good, upstanding citizen that cares about others and, can, and has a concern for others' well-being. It's a, it's a people that care only about themselves and their group and that hates anyone else that doesn't partake in what they do. 
And I tell you, that's, that's a sad, sad, sad state that a person could get in. But Jesus can save you. You don't have to do that. You don't have to hurt yourself anymore, and you don't have to hurt others. Come to Jesus Christ for salvation. Thanks for watching. Next time we'll start in Romans chapter 2. God bless.